Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It is Thursday. It is October 15th and we begin with breaking news from the campaign trail. That's right. We are hearing that Joe Biden's presidential campaign said Thursday that vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris will suspend in person events until Monday after two people associated with the campaign tested positive for coronavirus. Now the campaign said Biden had no exposure, though he and Harris spent several hours campaigning together in Arizona back on the 8th. Harris was scheduled to travel to North Carolina for events encouraging voters to cast ballots early. That's right. The campaign told reporters uh, this morning that Harris's communications director and a traveling staff member for her travel to Arizona tested positive after that October 8th trip. OK, so again, Vice Presidential nominee Kamala Harris suspending travel after uh, one or two staffers test positive for the coronavirus. And for now, let's look at today's nine at nine. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the remaining bars that have not reopened as restaurants will be able to reopen at 50% capacity by sometime next week. Wolf plans to file the necessary paperwork with the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission today. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden are holding separate town halls tonight at the same time. It comes after the debate initially scheduled for tonight was canceled. The Senate Judiciary Committee votes Thursday on whether to send Judge Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court nomination to the full Senate. If Barrett is confirmed, she will give the high court a 6-3 conservative majority. First Lady Melania Trump revealing that not long after she became infected with COVID-19, her son Barron tested positive too. The First Lady said he had no symptoms and has since tested negative. Famed college football coach Nick Saban has contracted the coronavirus. University of Alabama says he is self-isolating at home and coaching via Zoom calls. Carn City ISD has canceled all classes on all campuses and extracurricular activities for the rest of the six weeks after several staff members tested positive for COVID-19. The district says all campuses will undergo a deep cleaning. The federal government says USAA must pay a $85 million civil penalty. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency says there were deficiencies that led to violations of the Military Lending Act and the Service Members Civil Relief Act. Mill-in voters have already surpassed 2016 numbers in Bear County. The Elections Department says it has received 45,000 ballots in the mail. The San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo has announced it will take place in 2021 despite the pandemic. It'll take place February 11th through the 28th at Freeman Coliseum. And that is today's 9 at 9. And real quick, a breaking sports note. The Atlanta Falcons are shutting down their facility after multiple positive COVID-19 tests, according to Adam Schefter and ESPN. And uh, on that topic, we are seeing a lot of changes because of COVID-19. And most of it's been, of course, been negative. But there is a flip side to this. There are positives to uh, the pandemic in the year 2020. That's right. According to this article, uh, they listed about 11 of this year that have come about because of the pandemic. Number one, drive-ins, puzzles, and board games made a strong comeback. That's right. We here at KSAT kicked off our Something Good initiative. And if you look up this article on our website, you will see a link to those Something Good stories. And we also saw this locally. Distilleries around the country began mass producing hand sanitizer. Also, people began giving teachers the praise they have deserved all along. I've always praised teachers, Amen. but even more so now. Mm -hmm. And then healthcare workers also got the praise they deserved as well. Mm -hmm. uh, many people embrace their natural hair color <laughs> or were forced to embrace their yes. natural hair color. I, I was forced to embrace my grays for some time. Yes. And then also their uh, live stream concerts. Uh, some of these artists were uh, performing live, uh, well, for free over Zoom and other networks like that. People venturing out in the fresh air and got a bit more active. I definitely saw that. A lot of people riding their bikes. Also, Crayola gave us some new colors to describe what we were going through. Uh, that's right. To accurately uh, show color in the world, 
We also found new and creative ways to celebrate birthdays. Honk your horn if you've heard this before. <laughs> yes, a lot of drive-by birthday parties. Yes. Things I've never thought I would describe or invite people to. Before. And finally, someone who I think I could nominate if I was in the position uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize, and that would be John Krasinski <laughs> for sharing his YouTube series, Some Good News, which came right when we needed it the most. Oh, most definitely. My husband actually brought something up. Somebody was asking him, we hadn't seen him in a long time, like, hey, how are you doing? He was like, you know, everything's been interesting, but I've gotten to spend a lot more time with my family. Mm -hmm. So make that number 12. Number 12. Yeah. That's good to have a, a, a 12 yes. item list on yeah, KSAT 12. Hopefully we can keep adding to the list, right? Hopefully so. <laughs> Katie Blake is here in for Justin this morning. Good to have you here, Katie. Wow, look at that it out is. there. When do we start to see these uh, changes around here? This afternoon. So for the next few hours, uh, it's going to be pretty soupy out there. We've got some low clouds, some patchy fog, even a little bit of mist out there. It is just soupy to start the day. I want to start you off though with your pollen count. Things are looking pretty good today. We've got low counts of mold, ragweed, juniper, and pigweed. And uh, yeah, outside it's gross. 75. Winds still out of the south. What you're going to notice first this afternoon when that frontal boundary comes through is a change in our wind direction. It will become northerly and then wind speeds will increase by this afternoon and this evening. So yes, even though it is pretty gross out there right now, we've got some big changes on the way later today. I'm going to help you plan it out coming up in the full forecast and that'll be along in just a bit. Guys. Thank you, Katie. I-10 at Dominion. We had some slowdowns early, early this morning, but traffic flow appears to have resumed to normal, even though that is still a pretty active construction zone on the far northwest side. Top stories we are following today. New details about a crash where a man was hit by a driver while crossing a south side street. San Antonio police tell us the victim has died from his injuries. It happened around 8 last night at the 200 block of Morrison. Police say the man was not using a crosswalk while crossing the street when the driver of a GMC pickup hit him and then kept driving. The victim was taken to Bamsey where he later died. Right now we're still waiting to learn his name. Investigators say once caught, that driver will face charges of failure to stop and render aid. We are also waiting to learn the name of a man killed overnight after police say he was run over by a train. It happened around 12.30 this morning just east of downtown. Police tell us the train was stopped near the 1200 block of Pine Street. Investigators say the man was trying to cross the road by going underneath the train with his bicycle when the train suddenly began to move. Train went into emergency mode, came to a full stop. Officers say the conductor went to investigate and found the man crushed. Police say no criminal charges are pending in this case. A terrifying wake up call for a family on the northeast side. Police say they woke up to a popping noise and realized the garage was on fire. It happened around 430 this morning in the 4700 block of Emden Hollow, just inside 1604. When fire crews arrived, the garage was fully involved in flames. Crews were able to stop the fire from spreading to the home, but they say a car and a pickup that were parked in the driveway were damaged. Right now, investigators are looking into whether one of the appliances in the garage possibly sparked the flames. When your other morning headlines, new unemployment numbers are out, and there's good and bad in those numbers. And we'll show you what a World War II bomb looks like when it explodes in a canal. Our David Sears is here. Good morning, David. Good morning, David. Good morning, y'all. And we're going to make a Paul Simon reference this morning. Paul Simon? Song, singer, writer? Yes. Paul Simon, yes. That Paul okay. Simon? Got it. Some yes. people might have to Google Paul Simon. Though. Probably so. But We know who he is. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> you're older than some of the other ones. <laughs> hey. I'm, I'm, I'm going down that road. <laughs> First of all, the unemployment numbers for the week are out. Last week, 898,000 people applied for unemployment benefits. That's an increase of several thousand from the week before. Now, the government's report also said that the number of people continuing to receive unemployment benefits dropped by 1.2 million. That signals that people, many of those, are actually getting reemployed, going back to their old jobs, so that's a good sign. And that is a smashed windshield with a piece of metal right there, smacked right in there. See how that metal got stopped by the steering wheel of the driver's pickup? The pickup belongs to Eduardo Rivera, and he is lucky to be alive today. He was driving down the highway in South Florida when a flatbed truck pulled around in front of him. Then that big chunk of metal fell off the truck, bounced off the highway, and then right into his windshield. The windshield shattered, as you saw. The steering wheel stopped that chunk of metal from ending up in his face. Believe it or not, with all that flying glass, he only suffered some minor cuts on his face. He has a little angel in his vehicle that fell, that fell right on top of him. 
Um, and not one single piece of glass fell in his eyes. He walked out in one whole person, thanks to God. And the angel saved him. Turns out it was one of those flatbed tow trucks that pulled in front of him and dropped that piece of metal. Police are looking for that driver and also reminding folks to make sure that you secure whatever you are hauling. All right, let's take it to Poland. You're looking at a bomb dropped by the British Royal Air Force back in 1945 during World War II. Not just any bomb, it's a 12,000 pound tall boy nicknamed Earthquake Bomb. The Polish Navy decided that bomb needed to be disarmed. While they were in the process of disarming it, this happened. Yeah, boom, the bomb went off. Thankfully, no one was injured when it exploded. Matter of fact, out of an abundance of caution, the Navy evacuated about 750 residents while the disarming was going on just in case. Pretty good move. All right, for you old schoolers, little Paul Simon slip sliding away. Remember that song? All right, you're looking at a homemade slip and slide down the side of a hill in Idaho. Check that out, looks like fun. Joel Dustin decided he would use his mechanical engineering knowledge he was gaining through his classes at BYU, apply it to an attempt at a world record. He dug a little ditch, or a big ditch, down the side of the hill in his grandparents' backyard, laid down some plastic painter's tarps, got a garden hose to keep the slide wet, and then went after the slip and slide record. He brought in the local sheriff to document the run. He wanted to get it in the Guinness Book of World Records with the fastest slip and slide time over 100 meters. He was clocked at 10.4 seconds. To be honest, we weren't really planning on telling anyone. We just, yeah, it just kind of happened. We were just building a slip and slide and that was just kind of a side thing. But, um, Every one of my friends, we loved growing up here. We think Southeast Idaho is the best, so it's cool. Maybe we might be helping getting a little more attention over in this place because like it deserves it, right? Oh, you're going to get more attention, all right? He and his buddies will find out in January if you actually set the record, but they've gotten so much attention that MTV is going to feature them on their show, Ridiculousness. Have you ever seen that show? Just yeah. saw it recently, <laughs> well, the first time. Well, you might check these guys out. Yeah, they'll there. be on there. Mm -hmm. All right, now this is an odd story for the day. You're on board a couple of paragliders, and that is a vulture flying beside it. Incredible picture. And yes, that's on purpose. This is being shot in Spain, by the way. So the paragliders use the trained vultures to guide them through thermal columns in the air. That way, oh. the flight can be more like a bird. It'll last longer. And all the paragliders have to do is feed the creatures some raw meat and then fly like a bird. So he's like getting his little snack right there. Yeah. And then and he's gonna take off and lead him through that, uh, that thermal find area. Find those thermals, keep that lift going, yeah. and a longer ride then. But a vulture? A vul well, why not? Well, I don't know. Have you ever seen the vultures around here? I have. Yes, yeah. at Brackenridge Park. They're, yeah. big, they're big and scary, but <laughs> yeah. hey, they've got the wingspan for this job though. Yeah, yeah. here Ooh. they look a little graceful. Yeah, yeah. not too Pretty bad. cool. Yeah, thanks David. All right, thank <laughs> you. Right now it's 9, 10, 75 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. Do you have your costume picked out for Halloween already? What about your pet's costume, Mark? Hmm, we're going to look at some of the most popular outfits for dogs and cats this year. Is Senator John Cornyn's team feeling threatened by MJ Hagar's numerous TV ads? We'll check in with Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune later in the newscast. It's the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month, and to celebrate, we're bringing you the story of a Latino artist whose work is known across San Antonio, the nation, and even at an international scale. His mission and his goal just ahead on GMSA at 9. And welcome back. It's 914. It's the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month. It's a time when we pay tribute to the impact that generations of Hispanic and Latino Americans have had on our nation. Alicia Barrera sat down with Cruz Ortiz, a Latino artist based out of San Antonio and Houston, to talk about his rise and impact among the Hispanic and Latino community through his paintings and graphic design. You've seen his work on murals throughout the West Side, the tower on the city's south side that honors the dreams of Mexican Americans, and probably even when you take a sip of this Texas beer. I, I remember starting off thinking, man, I really want to have a show at the Blue Star, or you know what I mean? Like, and it kind of things just kind of unfolded. And now I really look at it as that I'm part of a network of, of a lot of artists producing work on 
many different levels. Ortiz says his art is a reflection of what he sees. My reality is there's a lot of brown people. It's Texas, you know, and Texas is a large community of Latinos. The colors, the facial features, and the Tex-Mex language in Ortiz's portraits all work together to capture the essence of Hispanic and Latinx American leaders. Especially with like the Castros or, you know, Dr. Ellen Clark, uh, you know, Willie Velasquez, who's work when I'm working for him a photograph, there's definitely like those historical perspectives that I think those people need to be recognized, like uh, Jovita Idar behind you. And, all these people are very important, and that becomes a theme, right? That group of work. A theme showcased by numerous institutions, including the Contemporary Art Museum of Houston, the Louvre in Paris, France, and the Smithsonian's Institution's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. But Ortiz also creates to help companies accurately portray and reach the Hispanic and Latino community through his design agency, Burnt Nopal. How this design is going to not only reflect in a prideful way, but also engage a community in a different manner. Thing like the Absolute Vodka bottle, uh, you know, Lone Star beer. I'm just, so it's really nice to be recognized like that. Creativity and curiosity are those big educational components that, you know, I think are going to lead people to the work. Ortiz will soon relocate to Houston with a goal to preserve and celebrate at an even larger scale, the Latinos and Hispanics making a difference through a creative lens. A very extensive portfolio for Mr. Cruz Ortiz. And just so you know, he's also one of the co-founders for the organization San Anto Cultural Arts. And they have a mission of creating murals. So he's the artist behind one of the artists, one of the many artists behind this mural and many that we see throughout the uh, west side. This one's actually titled Educación Education. It was painted in, back in 1994. So again, a lot of history that he has here in San Antonio. Mark Stephanie. And Alicia, with Election Day just weeks away, what is Ortiz doing to encourage Latinos to vote? So he actually has another program because democracy for him is very important for him and his wife, Olivia uh, Flores Ortiz. So they've started the Burro Brigade, and that is a volunteer carpool army. And what they do is take people um, all across San Antonio, really, and take them to the polls. So to get them the vote, and they use, of course, art as a form of education and outreach. So a lot that they're doing for the San Antonio community. Mark, Stephanie, back to you. Thank you very much, Alicia. Weather changes on the way. We've been talking about this now, seems like for days. And Katie Blake is here with an update <laughs> on when we can give the air conditioner a bit of a break. It has been the bright spot in the forecast. So we've, we've been talking about it. And yes, cold front day has finally arrived. Although if you've been outside already this morning, you're like, what cold front? 75, humid. Uh, we expect to get up to 90 degrees early this afternoon before that front arrives. But on your Friday, we're talking cloudy skies, a north wind and temperatures likely only maxing out near 70 degrees. So yes, big changes are on the way. It is pretty gross and soupy out there this morning. We've got a temperature in the mid 70s. Our dew point is also in the low 70s. Those numbers being close together means it feels pretty muggy out there. Winds are still out of the south at around 5 to 10 miles per hour. We have had a little bit of patchy fog here and there, but as of this hour, visibilities are not too bad. They're down a little bit in spots, but none of this fog is going to be too dense. What we do have out there that's fairly widespread is the low cloud cover that has developed early uh, this morning. That generally is sitting here kind of where you see this yellow color and then down to the southeast. We've got 75 up in San Antonio, 77 in New Braunfels, 68 in Rock Springs. There's the cooler air. Uh, it's still up in North Texas. They're there in 52 in Lubbock, 46 in Amarillo. The frontal boundary itself is actually starting to approach I-35 and we'll actually get the wind shift right around lunchtime. But as you can kind of tell, the cooler air lags behind just a little bit. And this is not going to be one of those blue northers or uh, big time Arctic fronts that really hit you with that cooler air. Uh, what you're actually going to notice first is the winds today. So I do want to break that down for you. We're looking at north winds in place from San Angelo up to Abilene and Wichita Falls. So that tells us where that front is. Looks like it again, it's trying to sneak in closer to the I-35 corridor uh, as we speak this morning. So as we go through the rest of the morning, Winds will stay out of the south about 5 to 10 miles per hour. But as we get closer to lunchtime, if you're up in the hill country out in Valverde County, Edwards County, you'll notice an uptick in your wind speeds even by lunchtime. Meanwhile, here in San Antonio, still light winds out of the south. But again, it should be between about 
noon and 2 p.m. that we see our wind direction change to the north and look by 5 p.m. North winds in place sustained about 15 to 25 miles per hour and it's going to stay fairly windy for the rest of the day even into the overnight hours 2 a.m. overnight our winds still about 10 to 20 miles per hour and even during most of the day on Friday things will stay breezy but our highest wind gusts should come late tonight and into the overnight hours. So these are your wind gusts. These numbers will be up closer to 35 40 miles per hour. Again, not really kicking in until late afternoon, early evening, but then staying gusty through the overnight hours. So if you have some loose outdoor decorations uh, or patio items, wouldn't be a good it wouldn't be a bad idea to kind of get those secured <laughs> as we get into the afternoon and evening hours. Temperature wise again, we should make it up into the upper 80s, low 90s this afternoon. Then that cooler, drier air will start to filter in by 8 o'clock. We're in the upper 60s by 10 o'clock. We're in the mid 60s with drier air in place. So we'll see that temperature drop and humidity drop lag a few hours hours behind the pickup in our wind speeds. As far as any rain is concerned, again, it's just not looking great. Couple of showers down on the coast. I do think we could have a few sprinkles kick in late tonight through early tomorrow, but no meaningful rain with this front. Unfortunately, tomorrow is our fall like day. We'll see temperatures upper 60s, low 70s tomorrow with low humidity all day long. Steph already said she's got her boots ready to go. Tomorrow is the boot day, ladies. Because then, as you see, yes. as we get into the weekend, we start to warm back up. So tomorrow is the boot <laughs> and the boot day, guys, just different kind of boot. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> Katie. Thank you, Katie. Uh -huh. 922, 75 degrees and still ahead on GMSA at nine. You can go ahead and play with your food. Thanks to this new game variety pack, how much it costs and where you can find it. Looks fun. 925 Consumer News this morning. Kraft Foods doing the way with its so-called Send Nudes campaign amid social media backlash. The company revealed the promotion earlier this month and it invited Kraft Mac and Cheese fans to send a free box or coupon for one to loved ones amid the pandemic. Now, the campaign was a play on words. Nudes, spelled N-O-O-D-S, sounds exactly like Nudes, N-U-D-E-S, spelled N-U-D-E-S, presumably hitting at hinting at nude photos. It's a joke, of course, but inspired angry reaction on social media. According to BuzzFeed News, some customers said the campaign, quote, sexualized mac and cheese, end quote. And as our, our parents always told us when we were kids, do not play with your food, but this story may be an exception. Yeah, it is. Kraft Heinz has come up with a variety game in pack, uh, a collaboration with the game publisher Big G Creative. It, it features games just inspired by Jello gelatin, Kraft macaroni and cheese, without the nudes, and Heinz ketchup. <laughs> Each of the three games is packaged like the food product. They're designed for ages eight and older and take about 20 minutes to play. The yeah, Heinz Variety Game Pack costs $19.99 and is available exclusively at Target stores and Target.com. I'll buy a K and an R for $500 to make it craft. There well, you go. All right. And earlier this week on GMSA at 9, we talked about some of the most popular Halloween costumes for humans, for people. But mm -hmm. what about our pets? Yeah, millions of people are planning to dress their pets this year. And the National Retail Federation has released the list of the most common ones. According to a survey, 10% of pet owners are choosing a pumpkin costume Aww. for their furry friends. 6% say they'll dress them as a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Other popular <laughs> costumes were a superhero and dressing a dog as a cat. Hmm, PetSmart says it's safe to dress up your pet, but introduce them to costumes carefully and make sure they have full mobility. So that costume right there, I can speak to that hot dog costume because I thought it was hilarious and I bought it for Gordo one year. Yes, what did Gordo think of said costume? He was not happy at all. And I and I actually, so I hung it up at first so he could get used to seeing it. Right. And then I kind of tried it on him one time. He didn't fight me, but he just looked annoyed. And then, you know, I had it on him and he just was really mad at me and I'll find yeah. you the picture and you'll understand. Awesome. He's got this look. Between now and Halloween, we have to find Gordo as the hot dog. <laughs> okay. I, I have to look for the hot dog costume. This is a few years back. And real quick, Truman is wearing a Halloween bow tie as of this Aww. week. Mm -hmm. He looks pictures, very dapper. Pictures. I know, I'll get one. <laughs> 928, 75 degrees.
More ahead on GMSA at 9. The road to the election has been full of roadblocks and detours, so what will election day look like this year? It's what the KSET Explains team sought to find out for this week's episode. Myra Artha and RJ Marquez break down the episode for us. New season of Bachelorette finally here and it's expected to be full of drama and controversy. So two of our GMSA producers who refuse to sleep want to help you process it all. <laughs> they join us in the studio to tell us more about their new vlog. And U.S. Senator John Cornyn and his team stepping up their game when it comes to TV ads. But why the change? We're going to check in with Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune after the break. A new Texas rule allows social workers to turn away clients who are LGBTQ and those with disabilities. The move, as you might have predicted, is being met with criticism. And we are seeing more dueling TV ads from U.S. Senator John Cornyn and MJ Hagar in the Senate race. Is it a sign that the senator's team is seeing Hagar as a threat? To answer that question and more, we have Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune joining us this morning. Good morning, Alana. Hey, Alana. Yeah, good morning. Well, first off, Texas social workers are criticizing a state regulatory board's decision this week to remove protections for LGBTQ clients and clients with disabilities who seek social work services. Why did Governor Greg Abbott recommend the change and what will it mean in practice? Well, he recommended the change because a, a law passed last year gives the governor uh, more jurisdiction, if you will, or, or say to make such recommendations to bring uh, rulemaking in line with state law, which he argued, uh, you know, the way this uh, profession was licensed uh, wasn't in line with state law. Uh, but yeah, basically it means that um, if a social worker has an objection or you know, they can deny services or refuse services of those you mentioned, those with uh, based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or if they have a disability. Uh, and they were met with criticism because social workers say they, they weren't able to give any input prior to the unanimous vote of this board. Uh, the board did get an earful after the vote uh, with one Houston social worker we spoke with, you know, saying that it feels like a personal and professional gut punch uh, given this this rule change. And uh, after hearing uh, several similar comments, the head of the board did agree to revisit the issue at its next meeting, uh, which happens October 27th. We'll see what happens. She didn't promise a re-vote or anything, but that she would revisit the issue uh, next time they, they convene. Let's touch on the election there for a moment, uh, Alana. U.S. Senator John Cornyn, he's running more ads while his challenger, M.J. Hagar, has been running ads for some time now. Is it a sign that Cornyn's camp sees Hagar as a real threat? Uh, possibly. You know, I mean, he is polling. He's leading in the polls, but by single digits uh, in several polls. And so that's a concern. But also, you know, we know he conceded that uh, she outraised him in this latest uh, quarter. Uh, we don't know by how much. Uh, we know that Hager raised 13 and a half million, uh, but uh, Cornyn didn't or hasn't uh, released his uh, figures. So there's money uh, inside and outside of Texas uh, in this race. It's definitely one people are watching, people are focused on possibly flipping the Senate. Um, but yeah, we'll see. You know, I mean, he's painting her as too liberal for Texas and that she's not in line with views of key industries here in the state. Uh, but she's also not backing down and, and says, you know, it shows that maybe they're terrified of the grassroots momentum her campaign has. So we'll know November 3rd or possibly shortly thereafter. And the University of Texas and Texas Tribune pollsters have asked registered voters in Texas about their views on policing. What are some of the top lines? Oh, that overall, uh, you know, it's a favorable view of police, but that's strong support from white voters, we asked, that offset uh, less favorable views from uh, voters of color. Uh, the starkest contrast was on the along partisan lines. You saw 84% of Republicans say they support uh, police, about 30% of Democrats, uh, you know, support police in their, you know, current state without any reforms. But they also, uh, differ kind of split along, uh, you know, different lines on what they think these are the results of as far as these interactions with black people and police, about 48% uh, call them part of a, a more systemic issue uh, with the police, about 41% see them as isolated incidents. So a lot of interesting findings there and you can find many more days of our poll where we asked about coronavirus vaccines, uh, as well as some uh, other uh, races at texastribune.org. All right, Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune. Have a great rest of your Thursday, Alana. Same to you. Thank you, guys. And taking a look out with live cam this morning, a humid 75 Ugh. degrees. Blech.
But we can't wait for the changes. <laughs> I know we do. I okay. I'm just. I just can't with this weather. So I'm ready for some some cooler air. Me some too. cooler, drier air. Yes, it arrives later today, and we're gonna kind of see things change gradually. And I'm gonna help you plan out your Thursday and Friday coming up in just a little bit. But first, let's check on visibility. It's pretty good right now. We did have some patchy fog out there, but uh, at this hour, things are fine. It is humid and it's warm. A lot of us are sitting in the mid to upper 70s, but there's that cooler air off to the northwest. It's going to be filtering in later today and this time tomorrow morning feeling a whole lot more like fall. We'll talk more about this cold front. Get you ready for the next couple of days coming up in just a bit, guys. Thanks so much, Katie. You can check out a new episode of KSET Explains this morning. The team's latest work is now out on KSET.com and the KSET TV app. This week, they're taking on a topic on everyone's mind, the election and the pandemic. Myra Arthur and RJ Marquez break down what you'll find in this week's episode. Whether this is the first time you're voting or if this is one of many presidential elections that you are casting a ballot in, this time around is going to be a first for all of us. Election 2020 is happening during a global health crisis. That's certainly something different. We talk about how COVID-19 mm -hmm. has changed everything and elections will be no different. So we're talking about all the changes that you will see in this episode when you head to the polls. 2020 has already been full of a lot of surprises, so nobody wants that when you actually right. go into a polling place. <laughs> so we're going to make sure that you have the heads up on what's changed and also how polling locations have changed in a pretty unique way in Bear County. Absolutely, Myra. I mean, just imagine if this was the first election that you were able to vote in. I mean, this is going to be an historic election. We're already seeing record turnout with early voting underway, and that was a big part of this episode. The amount of early voting sites that we have in the county and also the four mega voting sites. I was able to uh, check out the AT&T Center setup before early voting started, so you're going to kind of get to see what you will expect if you plan to vote at the AT&T Center. It is going to have the most voting machines out of all the polling locations across the county. And I've already heard from people that it, it kind of feels like you're going to a game or to the rodeo. <laughs> so it's definitely been a different experience, but I think that the county has done, uh, it has put in extra effort to really kind of make more of these sites available. So you'll get to check you'll get to see that. And, and we even saw already on early voting, the first day of early voting, that mega sites like that mm -hmm. were definitely needed. There were people who headed out there just for the experience mm -hmm. of voting uh, at a place like the AT&T Center. So all of that is part of this episode. And then we are also talking about what you're going to see, not only at the polls, but when it comes to what you will be voting on, there are a lot of tax propositions oh, yeah. uh, that voters are going to be asked to approve or not approve on the ballot. And some of the language in that can certainly be tricky. So we're breaking all of that down so that you make sure you know exactly what you're casting your ballot for when you head into the polls. And there's plenty of big races mm -hmm. between candidates, of course, to watch. Oh, yeah. And that's a big part of this, uh, this election is just informing voters and letting people know know what they're going to expect. You mentioned earlier all the PPE that's going to be out there. So in that effort to keep voters safe. But as far as races, I mean, we talk about the presidential election obviously gets the most attention naturally, sure. but there are so many key races going on across the county. Uh, the sheriff's race was one of the races that I previewed for KSAT.com. Uh, sheriff Javier Salazar looking to be reelected. That would be the first time in years that a sheriff would be reelected. And despite all the some of the issues that we've seen at the jail and in the office. I think that's going to be a key race. And I also previewed the uh, Senate race for uh, District 19. So that's going to be a big one there. Of course, Pete Flores won that district the first time in more than 100 years that a Republican held that seat. Roland Gutierrez is looking to get that back for Democrats. So a lot of different things and races to look at. Of course, the big story of 2020 is COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? But all of that is playing out in, in the middle of a really heated political climate. So we're touching on that as well and how so many people, whether it is your first time or not getting out to vote, people are eager. People are feeling some really intense emotions on a lot of different scales about this election. So we talked to people about why they're so eager to be involved this time around and also why they're eager to get other people involved. What it has been like to try to boost voter registration, which has happened here in Bear County, but 
what that effort has been like uh, during the, the new normal, as we keep calling it, that we are all living in right now. So this episode is out, available as we speak. You can watch it on demand, ksat.com, as well as the KSAT TV app. Absolutely. Thank you, Myra and RJ. Time now is 941 and 75 degrees for now. You're watching TMSA at 9. If you're a fan of Bachelor Aww. Nation, you will. this will be right up your alley. <laughs> That's right. Two of our GMSA producers are huge fans, so they started a recap vlog, and they're here in studio to tell us why we should watch. It's, Next. Big, it's bigger than huge. They're, they're huger fans than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Loyal. 945, welcome back. New season of The Bachelorette now airing on ABC. And to the biggest Bachelor Nation fans, we're right here at KSAT 12. <laughs> That's right. GMSA at 9 producer Oriana Cervantes and GMSA executive producer Joy Presley have created a weekly Bachelor recap vlog for KSAT.com. They join us now in our studio to tell us more about it. You guys are massive fans. All right, so oh, how yeah. <laughs> long have you guys been fans of The Bachelor franchise? Um, for me, it's been since I think 2013 is when I started watching. It was Sean Lowe's season of The Bachelor, and that was one of the best seasons of The Bachelor, I it think. It was, definitely one of the best. Um, that was when I started watching, so I've been watching ever since. I haven't missed an episode since then. What about you, Joy? <laughs> I've missed a few episodes, but I've been watching since before even that episode, mm -hmm. before that season. So it's been a long time. You yeah. guys never It's a great sleep. show. No, we, we don't, don't sleep. sleep. What is sleep? I heard that's a very nice thing. You guys are vampires. Yeah. The reason we're joking about it is because they work pretty much overnight. Yeah. Early, early morning hours, but they still stay up late to watch the show. So why did you guys to add, decide to add more work for yourselves and to do a vlog for KSET.com? Well, Joy, you want to take that because you kind of had one. So I actually had a bachelor blog, just not the vlog aspect of it, but just the blog part on KSET.com for a long time. And then I got really upset and started boycotting after Ari's season of The Bachelor because oh, me too. after that season, me too. I just got really upset. Those who watch The Bachelor know exactly what I'm talking about because he was not great. <laughs> we'll just say that. So, um, so after that, I got with Oriana because I, this was something that we were really excited about and wanted to get out there because we know there's a lot of people that watch the show too. Well, the morning after, we would always just talk to each other yes. for hours about the show. So we were like, we should just film ourselves and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what can people expect from the vlog? Um, they can just expect to see our reaction to the episode. We just talk about what happened. We break it down and we just give our insights and our thoughts. Definitely. And it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, People, it's a conversation with friends. Look at you guys right there. Uh, <laughs> so you, you, yeah, you're right. You never sleep. So we don't sleep. Where and when can people watch you guys? So um, it, it'll be on KSAT.com every week. The Bachelorette uh, airs on Tuesday nights this uh -huh. week. Uh, so we will record on Wednesdays and it should be up Wednesday night or, for, or, or Thursday morning. Sure. Seriously, look at you guys. It's Will so you cute. accept this vlog? It's We've got cute. about a minute left. All right, let's get the nitty gritty. Predictions for this season of The Bachelorette. Okay. Ooh, it's going to be a really good one. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about The Bachelorette, spoiler alert, uh, quitting halfway through the season. This has been reported by a lot of entertainment outlets mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, ABC has not confirmed it, but they kind of teased it, and so... Um, they basically confirmed it. They basically, they basically confirmed so, it. So, um, it is going to be really interesting to see if she does quit, and like why, and who this guy is that she supposedly falls in love with, and... It's going to be crazy. And what happens after. Mm. This has been unlike any other season, obviously, just like everything else this year has been so different, so... Um, it's going to be exciting to see how this all turns out. And it was recorded in a bubble, so uh, it's, yeah. in, it's interesting to see how the dates are going to turn out because they mm -hmm. usually travel all over the world, but not this time, so. Nope, not this you time. You guys are excited. Yeah. Were you surprised that they made it work with COVID? Yeah, I, I, I thought surprised. they were just going to be canceled indefinitely, but no, they, they put them on a bubble in Palm Springs, California, and they quarantined for like 14 days to got tested and filmed. I think right. they were all surprised too, actually. I, I bet they were. Joy, Oriana, thanks for coming in today. We're out of time. I know we could go for like another hour or six. <laughs> Definitely. Nice. Um, thanks for joining us. Talking about this, but I'm sure we'll have you back. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of up to Oriana, so we'll really <laughs> talk to her, okay? Yeah. We're doing it. We're okay, doing you're it. doing it. It's a done deal. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, guys. Uh, Katie Blake back with us now. And yes. uh, will with you. Ex oh, oh, I love yeah. the banner on your map. I had to. Folding right into the Bachelorette theme. Oh. Will y'all accept the cold front? We will.
Okay. We shall. I don't How think any, cute. <laughs> if anybody turns it down, I'm going to be real upset. Yes, Scold's Grunt. Uh, working into our part of Texas as we speak, by tomorrow, feeling a whole lot more like fall out there, but it's not going to stick for very long. So this afternoon, before that cooler air starts to filter in, we'll be near 90. Tomorrow afternoon, upper 60s, low 70s for high temperatures. Saturday, still okay, but by early next week, we'll be back in the upper 80s. So we've really got to soak it in and live it up as we get into tomorrow. Today is Adam Cassie uses this term and I really like it when we have fronts coming through as our transition day when things will start to change through the middle of the day. Still muggy. I do think we'll start to see a bit more sun by midday as well. Frontal boundary itself should be through San Antonio by lunchtime, so we'll see our wind direction change from south to north by early afternoon. It'll be mid afternoon that our wind speeds start to increase, so it will be, be becoming breezy by the middle of the afternoon, lower humidity settling in late afternoon, early evening, and then our temperatures really beginning to fall off into the low 70s by 7 p.m. mid 60s by 10 o'clock tonight. And I actually think we're starting to see the front on visible satellite. Looks like it is working into Gillespie County and Fredericksburg right now. We've got that nice kind of clearing line there north of Fredericksburg and Austin. I do believe that's our front. Something else that indicates the frontal boundary itself is starting to get closer. We've had a change in our wind direction out of Fredericksburg. So in Kerrville, wind is out of the south. In Fredericksburg, it is out of the east. So that is likely the beginning of the wind shift that indicates that cold front is starting to move into the hill country. So here's how your winds are going to play out today. That is going to be the first thing that you notice an uptick in wind speed. So through early to mid afternoon, starting to become breezy. It'll be windy at times late this afternoon into the evening hours. Even overnight, we'll see some wind gusts up closer to 30, 35 miles per hour. So turning gusty late today into tonight. I mentioned this last half hour, but if you've got loose Halloween decorations out on the patio, wouldn't be a bad idea to secure those uh, because it will be gusty at times late this evening and into the overnight hour. So the wind shift will be first later today. That's when we'll start to see our dew points drop and our temperatures drop a bit as well. So through the early afternoon, starting to get some drier air in the hill country, but still muggy here in San Antonio. Then by this evening, drier air moving in for everyone. That's also when we'll see our air temperatures drop a bit. Now, unfortunately, everything looks good with this front, except the chance of rain. It's just not there. A couple of showers will be possible later today down closer to the coast, not expecting much here in San Antonio, except maybe a couple of sprinkles overnight through early tomorrow morning. Otherwise, that will be about it in terms of rainfall, just not in the cards for us. This does set us up, though, some good news for some great Friday night football weather tomorrow. Temperatures in the 60s, low humidity, partly cloudy skies, a nice breeze tomorrow evening. Northeast winds 5 to 15. So while it will be windy tonight, by later tomorrow football games, things definitely uh, won't be as windy. So tomorrow is our one fallish day. Saturday will be comfortable, but humidity will start to pick up second half of the day Saturday, so it won't feel quite as crisp out there. Guys, very exciting news. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, 952, 75 degrees. We'll be right back. And tomorrow on GMSA at 9, it's a term that some may have heard being used more often, Latinx. But what exactly does it mean and who identifies with it? Our Eric Hernandez finds out tomorrow at 9. All right, warm and muggy into early this afternoon, and then things start to change, especially by this evening. Windy overnight, much cooler tomorrow morning, mid to upper 50s. Thank goodness. We'll know the frontier when Katie's on the roof aiming in a northerly direction with a scarf on. <laughs> Exactly. We're ready for that. Thank you so much, Katie. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you back here for the news at noon.